Well, to start tonight, I just want to tell you about a time when I dressed up and pretended to be someone who I wasn't. Uh, I, I was the college pastor at a church in Waco, Texas for, for seven years. So that meant I spent the vast majority of those seven years at a single place. And it was uh, the Chick-fil-A right across from Baylor's campus. I know with college students, they're like every other day, it seemed like. So I spent a lot of time there and I, I walked in there like every other day and uh, go up to the cash register. And if you've been at Chick-fil-A, you kind of know what that's like because the, the people who work there, they're eager to be there, which is awesome. And in th on this particular day, it, it was a high school student working the cash register, and he's just kind of this over-eager, excited high school kid. And when I walk up to the cash register, he goes, Ben, it's so good to see you today. And again, if we haven't met before, my name's not Ben. <laughs> my name's Nate. So I have a decision to make, and I'm like, man, do I correct him? Or like, This is just kind of awkward. But I'm like, man, this kid's like in high school. I'm going to be Ben today. And uh, so I, I uh, placed my order, spicy chicken sandwich meal with, with Coke Zero, and, uh, and eat my food, leave, don't think twice about it. Show up like two days later, again, and it's the same guy behind the cash register. And I'm just waiting in line going, Lord, please don't let me go to him. Please don't let me go to him. I end up going to him, and he goes, Ben, you're back. It's so good to see you. And at that point, I'm like, <laughs> I guess I'm Ben now. Like, like, this is just who I am. So for the next few weeks at that Chick-fil-A, I was Ben. In fact, it got so ingrained in me that even when I went through the drive-thru alone by myself, and uh, it, it wasn't even the, the guy who like, took my order on the iPad. It wasn't even this kid. It was someone else. And I said, hey, my name is Ben. Placed my order. <laughs> I know. And then, then I go, I, I, I struggle with uh, like people pleasing, I think. And I'm just like, I can't correct people. And uh, anyway, I go up to the, the order, the, the window where, where they give me my order. And my nightmare happened. It was someone I actually knew. <laughs> like it was a friend who was working there. And he goes, Nate, I'm so sorry. This normally doesn't happen, but, but somehow, some way, we lost your order. <laughs> and I go, hey, by chance, <laughs> is there an order for Ben? <laughs> and he goes, oh, yeah, it's the next order. Why? And I'm like, I accidentally maybe said my name was Ben. <laughs> and he, he just, like, took the bag, gave it to me. He's like, I don't know what's going on. And I will never forget that feeling. I drove away that day going, from now until eternity, I'm no longer Ben. When I walk into that Chick-fil-A, I'm going to walk in with my chest out and say, hey, my name is Nate Hilgenkamp. And I'm proud to tell you that from that day until now, I have gone by Nate Hilgenkamp because I made the decision that that teenage kid was not going to bully me anymore. <laughs> he didn't have the right to name me. I start, I start there tonight. It's a ridiculous story, 100% true story. I, I start there tonight. Because I want you to know, you've given some people some power in your life that have no power to name you. I, I think some of you have a very, very similar story. It doesn't look as ridiculous as my story does, but I bet you've taken a name from someone who has no power to name you. Maybe for you, it was your mom back in middle school, and she said, you know, you're not really as pretty as everyone else is. And from that moment until right now, in the back of your mind, you've taken on the name of I'm just not very attractive. Or, or maybe for you, you were in a relationship with someone and they broke up with you and they said, you know, I just don't really enjoy being around you. You're not a very fun person to be with. And from that moment until now, you've just taken on the name of I'm unenjoyable. Or maybe for some of you, you've taken a name from, from your sin. Maybe it's your lust or your anger or your pride or your cynicism, whatever it is, you've allowed that sin to name you and in the back of your mind, you've taken on the name damaged goods. Or maybe you've let a coach or a teacher or a professor or a boss name you. They, they, they said you're just not really as talented as everyone else seems to be and you've taken on the name forgettable. Friends, I'm here to tell you, you've taken on a name from someone who has no power to name you. So tonight, what we're going to do is we're going to look at what God has named you. The only one who has any power, any authority in your life to give you a name, he's given you a name. And in fact, Scripture says that he's given you a lot of names. Tonight, we're specifically going to look at one name. This name has gripped my heart over, over the last uh, few months. It's just gripped me. Maybe it's going to grip you 
as well. And we're going to look at it in 1 Peter. Uh, so if you have your Bibles, open them up, turn them on to 1 Peter. If you need some help finding out where it is, just go to 2 Peter. It's right before that. And so hopefully that'll help. It's at the very end of your Bible. And uh, we'll be in 1 Peter. We're just going to be 1 Peter chapter 1 at the beginning of 1 Peter. And whenever I say 1 Peter, you might not know a whole lot about 1 Peter. And here, here's maybe a reason why. I was reading a commentary on, on 1 Peter, and it was written by a professor. And he said, uh, he always likes to ask his, his class, hey, what's your favorite book of the Bible? And he always gets really a, a similar responses. For the person who's more theological-minded, they, they might say Romans. For the, for the more charismatic Christian, they might say the book of Acts. Um, uh, for, for the person who really cares about joy of the Lord, they might say Philippians. For, for the more practical-minded, they might say James or Proverbs. Or, or maybe if you love to worship, you might say the book of Psalms. Like, th those are typical, maybe, maybe one of the Gospels. But he had one class... Where, where, where two people in that class both said First Peter. He's like, what in the world? Why First Peter? So, so he was trying to figure out what, what, what relation these two had with one another. And he started asking them a couple questions, and he realized that they had one thing in common. N neither of them was from America. And, and they were from places where, where Christians were persecuted. And he said, hey, why is First Peter your favorite book of the Bible? He goes, oh, they, they both said, oh, it's like all of our favorite book of the Bible. Because it speaks to what it's like for us to follow Jesus. So as we get into 1 Peter, you just got to know that's what this book is talking about. It's going to talk about social marginalization and suffering. And one of the reasons why I want to be in 1 Peter is because I think that's where we're going in America. We're going to get more marginalized and we're going to receive more suffering as believers in Jesus. But I also want to make sure you know that 1 Peter is not just about social marginalization and suffering. But importantly, it's about hope in the midst of it. So, so that's really the, the background of the book. To give you some, some uh, even more background on, on the setting of the book, it, it was written in a, about 63 A.D. Is, is kind of the best guess. 63 A.D. is when, is when uh, First Peter was written. And it was written during the time when Nero was the, the Roman emperor over, uh, over the Roman Empire. And it, if you don't know much about Nero, he, he was a wicked, wicked, depraved man. Here is an example uh, he, historians believe that, that he, he kicked one of his wives to death, literally murdered her by kicking her to death. And then uh, after he buried her, he, he found a, 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 a young boy who he thought looked like his, his old ex-wife. He, he took that young boy and, and married him, made him dress up like his ex-wife and, and treated him like he was his ex-wife. I mean, it's just like wicked, depraved stuff. That, that, that's who the Roman emperor was at this time. Maybe you've heard of the, the great fire of Rome. The historians also believe that it was actually started by Nero. It burned 75% of the city. Historians believe that he, he burned it <coughs> on his own so that he could rebuild the, the city however he wanted it to. And then once, once the fire was eventually put out, he had to blame someone, so he decided to blame Christians. So he, he, from that moment on, he began to round up Christians, thousands of Christians, and he would begin to kill them. You, you know, the Roman Colosseum, he'd bring them into the Roman Colosseum. They'd be eaten alive by lions. Uh, he would also take Christians, he would crucify them. He would also take Christians and he would, he would lift them up on a pole at night and then burn them at the stake so that he could look at his gardens. That's when this was written, 63 A.D., Four years after this, Peter himself would be crucified upside down for following Jesus. That's the amount of persecution and suffering that was going on in this time. And that's what this book was written into. That's what this letter was written into. And, and Peter's going to say, hey, you're going to suffer for following Jesus. And I just want to make sure you know that's what you've signed up for. Suffering and persecution and pain doesn't mean you're doing something wrong. It means you're doing something right. And one of the reasons why I wanted to, to speak on First Peter tonight is I think we're going to receive more persecution, more suffering, and more pain for following Jesus. And I think the church in America is surprised by this. We're like, why is it so hard to follow Jesus? And, and Scripture's going, we already told you. The Holy Spirit's going, I, I told you this is what it would be like. Because I, I think for us as followers of Jesus, whenever we're surprised that it's hard to follow him, it, it's like a Navy SEAL that's surprised that he doesn't get to sleep in. It, it's like he or she signed up for hard. 
you, as a follower of Jesus, if you claim to know Jesus in this room tonight, you have signed up for difficult. That's what it's like as a follower of Jesus. You've signed up for a difficult life here because you know you're going there one day. So I know it's a long setup on this book. I just want to make sure you know what First Peter is. And, and as, as he starts, he's going to start by saying, hey, it's really, really hard to live in this world well. But if you're going to live in this world well, you need to know who you are in Christ first. And to put it another way, you need to know who you are before God so that you can live well before man. So First Peter chapter 1, verse 1, this is what he says. He opens by telling them, who they are. This is their name in Jesus Christ. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to God's elect exiles, scattered throughout the provinces of Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. All all of that, if you're wondering where that is, all of that is right now modern day Turkey. Now this next verse, I love this next verse. I don't know another verse in scripture that, that better speaks to who the Trinity is, what the Trinity does. It says this, verse two, You who have been chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through the sanctifying work of the Spirit to be obedient to Jesus Christ and sprinkled with his blood. I love that. He's saying you're saved by the blood of Jesus so you can be obedient to the commands of Jesus. And then he finishes by saying grace and peace be yours in abundance. Okay, so from my point of view, in those those first couple verses, Peter has already given us three names here. Two of them are very similar to one another. One is is very different. Two two of the names are elect and chosen. He's saying you are chosen by God. God saw you and he loves you and he wants you. You're you're elected by him. You're chosen by him. They're both very similar. But then he also gives you another name. And that name is, is really the exact opposite of that name because it's the name exile. He he begins by saying, You are the elect exile. If you've got your Bibles, man, I would would underline that because I think that's important. You are the elect exiles. And that's the first thing we can learn tonight. Point number one, in Jesus, we are the elect exiles. And and those things are are really in conflict with with one another. We're we're chosen by God, but exiled by the world. Uh, Another word for for that name, for that that word exile is foreigner. So so really what he's trying to communicate is this. If, If you've ever been to another country... Uh, before, you kind of know what this feels like. Like you get off the plane and then you, you walk out in, into the streets and, and you don't know the language. You, you don't know, you don't really understand what, what people are eating maybe. You don't understand what, what side of the road people are on. Like everything just seems to be confusing because this isn't your home. And Peter's going, this is what it should feel like as followers of Jesus. You should feel like a foreigner here in this land. Or, or to put it another way, I don't know anything about the game of cricket. Maybe some of you guys know how to play cricket. You've played cricket before. you watch cricket. I don't know anything about the game of cricket. If you put me in the game, I wouldn't know where to run. I don't know if you run. I, I wouldn't know how to score points or goals or runs. I, I don't know what, what goes on in the game of cricket. I'd be completely lost. Peter's saying, this is how you should feel in this world. You should feel like an exile. You should feel like a foreigner. You should walk around the streets and go, man, I don't understand the language that people are speaking it. You should walk around and go, man, I don't know where people are trying to get to. You should go, man, I don't know the things that people are trying to consume here. I just don't understand this world. And here's what it should practically look like. In your life, if you're a believer in Jesus, if you are an elect exile here on earth, You should be confused by how the world lives. You should be confused by how the world views gender and sexuality. You you should be confused by how the world views alcohol. You should be confused by how the world seeks after their career. You, You should be confused by how the world values sports so much. You should look at what everyone else is doing and go, man, I just don't get it. It's like I'm in a foreign land. You should be like, man, what world am I living in? You should be like, man, it's like we're living by two different set of rules. It's like we're taking two different orders. It's because we are. The the world's taking its orders from the prince of darkness. We're taking our orders from the king of kings. It should not feel like we're at home because we're not. We're the exiles here. But the problem for the church in America, the problem for me, is that I want to be a Christian and feel at home in the world. I want to be accepted by God 
and accepted by the world. But we can't because we are the elect exiles. God chooses us, which means the world will not. In fact, elsewhere in Scripture, it says this in James 4, 4, You adulterous people, <clears throat> don't you know that friendship with the world means enmity against God? Therefore, anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. So you're either going to feel at home here or you're going to feel at home there with God. And I just want you to know this because this is what you're signing up for. You're signing up to be rejected and left out. You're signing up for potentially not getting that promotion because you follow Jesus. You're signing up for not dating that person because you follow Jesus. You're signing up for not watching that show or that movie because you follow Jesus, because this is not your home and you're not going to be accepted here. And really what it should feel like as a follower of Jesus, some of you, I know we got like hot dogs in here and uh, there's a shark somewhere. Like think how ridiculous you would feel if you wore that like on January third. Like you're walking around your work, you'd feel ridiculous. In many ways, that's what it should feel like on a daily basis for us as followers of Jesus. Going, man, I just don't feel like I fit in here. Everyone's looking at me funny. No one seems to understand me. It's because this world is not our home. Don't for a second get comfortable here because we're only going to be gone. We're only going to be here for this long and then we're going to be in eternity with Jesus forever. So the first thing I want us to understand is that our name as followers of Jesus is we are the elect exiles. Let's keep reading. It says this in, in verse three. Praise be to God and father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope. This is what our name means. We've been given a new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. This inheritance is kept in heaven for you. So why does your name matter? Here, here's, here's what your name means for your life today. Um, imagine if my name was Nate Zuckerberg or Nate Musk or, or Nate Bezos. What, what would that mean? It would mean that eventually, at one point in my life, I would receive an, uh, an absolutely massive inheritance. I, I would be wealthy one day because I would receive all that my father has. In, in, in the same way, in verse 3, it says that we have a new birth into a living hope, which means we've been reborn into a new family. It means that we've been reborn into God's family, which means that our name has changed. So my name is something different. My name is Nate Hilgenkamp, child of God. And if that's the case, what can you conclude? That, that means that I have access to everything my dad has access to, which is the second point. Second thing we can learn here is that in Jesus, we are given an imperishable inheritance. So let's talk about this for a minute. What does this mean, an, 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 an imperishable inheritance? Anyone know what NFTs are? I bet you do. Yeah, so they're a really, really big deal in, in COVID. And... Uh, he, I have a picture of one, I believe. So uh, here's, a, here's an example of an NFT. An NFT is really just like a, a screenshot of the internet, which I know it's more than this, but it's not. Sorry, crypto bros. Uh, it's, it, it's like a screenshot of the internet that you can pay for, that you can own. Um, so anyway, here, here's a picture of one. This is from the, the first ever tweet by Jack, the guy who set up Twitter. And uh, it went for sale in, in 2020, and he, he bought it. Someone bought it for 2.9 million dollars 2.9 million dollars it, it went up for auction uh about a year and a half after he bought it and uh it it it, it, it the, the starting bidding was at 48 million dollars after all the bidding war had had, had ended the, the the biggest offer that the, the 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 person who owned this got was 280 dollars and not $280 million. The, the highest offer this guy got was $280. You see, he had just bought a depreciating asset. He bought something that he, immediately after he purchased it, 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 it became worthless. He bought something that perished, spoiled, and faded. Friends, some of you right now, you're buying things that will perish, spoil, and fade. You're, you're buying the belief that, that having a relationship is all there is in this life. You're buying the belief that how much money you make is all there is in this life. You're buying the belief that having a certain social media following is all there is in this life. Friends, those things will bankrupt you. 
They will leave you empty because they're depreciating assets. They will perish, spoil, and fade. On the other hand, what this passage is saying is if you believe in Jesus, you are given an, an imperishable inheritance that can either perish, spoil, or fade. And it's not going anywhere. The economy can't touch it. Your performance can't touch it. What other people view you can't touch it because Jesus is holding it in his hands. And one day you're going to enter into eternity and he's going to give it over to you. That's what it's like to follow Jesus. And that should change the way we live. I mean, what a relief. Think about that. If you knew that you had this massive inheritance to you coming one day, why would you be so stressed out about the little things? Why would you be so concerned? Because you know what's coming to you one day. It should change your life. And yet, for so many of us, it doesn't. On a daily basis, it doesn't. And maybe it's because you just don't believe it. I know for the vast majority of people here today, we say we're believers in Jesus. I don't know, do you really believe in him? Does this really change your life? Because look, look, at, look again at verse 3. It says that the Christian is the one who has been given a new birth. You must be totally reborn. You're not an updated version of the old you. You're an alive version of the dead you. You've been given a new birth into a living hope. And, and, and here's where we need to wake up. For many of us, we've been lulled to sleep thinking we're a Christian. Meanwhile, we, we put our hope in things that are dying. Your, your hope, the thing you daydream about, the thing you'll be crushed if you don't get. Your, your hope is that this is the year that you're going to get in a relationship. That's what you want more than anything else. This is the year I'm going to get in a relationship. Or, or your hope, the thing you care the most about is that one day you'll move into that neighborhood. You'll have one of those houses. Or your hope, the thing you care more than anything about is that one day you'll be an, an, an executive in your company. Or your hope, the thing you care more than anything else about is that, is that you hope that one day your dad will finally say that he's proud of you. And that's what you're hoping in. Friends, I just want you to know that you are putting your hope in dying things. Those things can't sustain, sustain you. Those things won't last because those things are dying. And friends, when our focus is just on the things of this world, when your hope is just on the things of this world, when your focus is just on this life, it makes it look like you don't believe in the next life. When you only care about here, it looks like you don't really care that much about there. Because you see, on the other hand, the Christian is, is something different. The, the Christian is someone who has a living hope. So what does that mean? That, that, that means you placed your hope in something or someone that is alive and cannot die. So what would that be? Who would that possibly be? Verse 3 says this, that you've been given a living hope. What is it? How? through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Christians believe this, that they have placed their hope, faith, and trust in the fact that God so loved you, that he gave his one and only son for you, that 2,000 years ago he left eternity, he left heaven to enter into earth, be born into a slimy and smelly manger. He lived 30 perfect years, then he lived three years in ministry, seeking the lost, serving other people, loving other people, only to be arrested so that he'd be crucified and so that he would die for you. Then he would be buried for three days and then after three days he'd rise from the dead so that death no longer has its say over you. Death no longer has mastery over you. Sin no longer has the final word because you placed your hope in Jesus who has defeated death. We have a living hope as believers in Jesus, not a dying hope. So, so Peter is saying, church, it doesn't matter what you go through here. It doesn't matter what you go through now because you know what you're getting later. You'll be punished now. You'll be cherished later. You're cut down now. You'll be comforted later. You're poor now. You'll be rich later. Because, you see, we're, we're the elected exiles on earth. But one day we'll be the elected citizens of heaven. And that's good news. And that should change our life. Yeah, there we go. Come on. <clears throat> so point number two, in Jesus, we have an imperishable inheritance. So let's just close out this passage. I'm going to read again the, the end of verse four and then verse five. It says this. This inheritance is kept in heaven for you, and then verse five, who through faith are shielded 
by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. So, so this is really one of the most important parts of Peter's teaching. We've got, we got to lean into this section. Uh, because we make it to our salvation, we make it to the last day, not because of our good works or our sheer resilience. It says this, we make it to the coming of our salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. How, 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 how? By the shielding of God's power. This is so important. This is point number three, third thing we can learn. In Jesus, we are shielded by God's power. What does that mean? Here's what I think that means. Uh, This summer, our our family went to Branson, Missouri. Have any of you guys ever been there? (laughs) Yeah. We got to go to a family camp at Canacuck, which is a a great organization. And uh, part of our time there, we got to go on a on a uh, pontoon ride on a, something called Lake Tanicomo, uh, which is like the, the weirdest lake I've ever been on because it's a river and it also takes uh, its, its, its water from the bottom of another lake there in Branson, Table Rock Lake. So what that means is that the lake is just, Lake Tanicomo is just like freezing water. It's the bottom of, a, of another lake. It takes that water, it's freezing. In fact, I've got a picture of it. We're on this pontoon ride. Yeah, that's my daughter. She's two and a half. And uh, as you can see with that picture, there's like this like fog coming off, off, off the lake. And as far as I know, it's like that every single day in Branson. Because it's like 95 degrees outside, but, but the water's like 40 degrees. It's like basically freezing water. Um, so, which means it's, it's like oddly like really hot and really cold outside at the same time when you're on the water. So we're on this pontoon ride and we're having a blast until... After a while, I, like the wind's beating in our face, and the wind's actually really, really cold because it's up against the water. And so my two-year-old, she just begins to lose her ever-loving mind. And uh, it, it made absolutely everyone miserable. She's, she just keeps going, I want to go back. I want to get off the boat. Take me home. And, and I'm like, we all want to get off the boat too. You're making this miserable. And uh, it's not what I said. I was kinder. <laughs> I was kinder than that. But, I mean, she's just losing her mind. Eventually, we, we convinced the, uh, the, the boat driver to, to turn around. But we were a ways back. We were a ways from where the boat was initially docked. So she's just losing her mind. She's getting really, really cold. She's really bothered by the wind. So eventually, I just pick my two-year-old up, and, and I, I turn my back to the wind. And as we're driving back home, the, the, the whole time, I just keep telling in her ear, I squeeze her in really close, try to block the wind. I say, Jaycee. We're going home. We're going to make it. Dad's going to keep you safe. JC, we're going home. We're headed back. Dad's going to keep you safe. JC, we're going home. We're headed back. Dad's going to keep you safe. I I don't know what you've been through in life. I I bet you've been through some things. So have I. I mean, I could tell you about a lot of those instances. One instance was, uh, I don't know, two years ago, year and a half ago, two years ago, we, we, we went through a miscarriage. It was really, really hard. It felt like the winds of this world were just beating up against me. You know what else I felt? I felt my Heavenly Father pick me up, turn his back to the wind and say, Nate, we're going home. You're going to make it. Dad's going to keep you safe. Nate, we're going home. You're going to make it. Dad's going to keep you safe. That's what this scripture means. And just like that story with my daughter and Branson, I wasn't able to protect her from all the winds of this world. In in the same way, you're still going to feel the wind in your life, but I just want you to know you're also going to feel your father. He's going to pick you up. He's going to turn his back to the wind, and he's going to make sure you know that he's going to take you home. He's going to shield you by his strength from the waves and the winds of this world. That's what this passage means. And, and I don't know about you, but, but sometimes life just gets really, really hard. Life gets really, really windy, and the waves feel really, really, really big. And there are just times I, I'm a pastor, and I even sometimes feel like, God, I just want to tap out. I, I don't feel like I have the strength on my own to make it to the end of my life still following Jesus. Like, God, I don't think I have what it takes. Here's the good news. I don't have what it takes. You don't have what it takes. Because you don't get to the end of your life still following Jesus off your own strength, 
but by God's spirit. In fact, that, that's what it says here in this passage. You don't make it home because of your strength. You make it home because of his shielding. Because, friends, your salvation is not dependent upon you. Your sanctification is not dependent upon you. Your stability is not dependent upon you. Because, again, listen to the words just used in, the, in these verses. Verse 1, it says, To God's elect who have been chosen according to the foreknowledge of God through the sanctifying work of the Spirit. Skipping ahead, it says, In his great mercy, he has given us a new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Again, skipping ahead, oh, this, this inheritance is kept in heaven for you who through faith are shielded by God's power. You know what those verses are describing? They're describing God's preeminence and not your performance. Because, friend, your salvation is not dependent upon you. Your stability is not dependent upon you. And this is the joy of following Jesus. You're not accepted into the kingdom of God because of you. You're not accepted and saved because you deserve it, because you're not defined by what you've done. Because in the kingdom of God, this is the joy of following Jesus. You receive a name not because you deserve it. You receive a name not based off your net worth. You receive a name not based off your social standing. You receive a name not based off your career path. Because in Jesus Christ, you're not defined by your relationship status or your job title or the car you drive or the money in your bank account. If you're a follower of Jesus, in him, you are defined by what he says you are. And he says here that you're chosen, loved, accepted, redeemed, and that you are an elected exile. And you have that name because he gave it to you. And he's the only one in your life who has the power and the authority to give you that name. So point number three, the third thing we can learn is this, that in Jesus we are shielded by God's power. Your life is all about him. It's not about you. So in summary, Tonight, point number one, in Jesus, we are the elect exiles. Point number two, in Jesus, we have an imperishable inheritance. Point number three, in Jesus, we are shielded by God's power. Well, you may not know this, but, but Peter, the guy who wrote First Peter, Peter wasn't his birth name. Uh, the, the story of Peter is, is Jesus found Peter. He, he, his name was actually Simon. His birth name was Simon. <coughs> Early on in the Gospels, Jesus is calling disciples, and, and he says, hey, Simon, come follow me. And uh, Simon follows Jesus. Eventually, uh, Jesus said, hey, hey, Simon, your name will no longer be Simon, but your name will be Peter, which means rock. And on this rock, I will build my church. Fast forward a couple more pages, and, and Jesus is, is, is arrested. And uh, you might know this if you know the Gospel story well, but on the night that he was arrested, Peter the rock on which Jesus was going to build his church would deny Jesus three separate times, even to a, a little servant girl. So Jesus is arrested, crucified, buried, and then raises back to life. Then there, there's a story that I've read, man, a hundred times, maybe more than that. But there's something that stuck out to me in, in a new way when I recently read this. Because there's a story where, where, where Jesus interacts with Peter uh, again, after, after Peter had just denied Jesus three times, Jesus goes and he restores Peter. Peter's on, on a boat, and then Peter <coughs> jumps off the boat, swims to the shore, interacts with Jesus. Again, I've, I've read this a like hundred times, but I had never really picked up on this before. Because it's interesting, the word, the, the name that Jesus uses to speak to Peter in this moment. In that moment, after Peter had just denied Jesus three times, he, he, goes this, he, he goes like this, he says this. He says, Simon, do you love me? And then Peter goes, you know I love you, Lord. And, and then Jesus goes, Simon, do you love me? And Peter goes, you know I love you, Lord. And then Jesus goes, Simon, do you love me? And Peter goes, you know I love you, Lord. I think Jesus used that name for a reason because Jesus used every word for a reason. You see, that name would have been piercing for Peter to hear. For years and years now, he had gone by the name Peter, but, but Jesus calls back to, to his birth name, the name given by his father. He said, Simon, 
do you love me? And really, I think he's saying that for a reason. I think he's saying, hey, Peter, Simon, who are you going to be? Or maybe the better question is, who are you going to listen to? Are, are you going to take the name that man has given you, or are you going to take the name that I have given you? Simon, Peter, who are you going to be? Well, if you read the rest of the Gospels and, and, and the rest of Acts, he made a decision. And throughout the rest of the book of Acts, he would go by Peter, and he'd live by, Pe- by the name of Peter, and he'd be the rock on which Jesus would build his church. I end with that tonight because, man, I just want to ask you guys, who are you going to be? What, what name are you going to take on? What, what name are you going to believe? Are you going to take on the name that this world has given you, that man has given you, or are you going to take on the name that Jesus has given you? Are you going to continue to take on the name forgettable, unattractive, sinner, broken, unwanted, unloved? <coughs> Excuse me. Are, or are you going to go by the name forgiven, seen, accepted, redeemed? Who are you going to be? Or the better question tonight is, who are you going to believe? Who are you going to listen to? Are you going to listen to the name this world has given you? Or are you going to listen to the name the King of Kings has given you? Let me pray be that one. Father, I, I love tonight because Tonight, a lot of us look on the outside what we look like on the inside. A lot of us showed up here tonight in costume, pretending to be someone else. But on the inside, a lot of us have day after day, not just today on Halloween, but day after day, we've been pretending to be somebody else. We, we, we've taken on a name that wasn't given to us by you, but was given to us by our mom, or a coach, or a boyfriend, or a girlfriend. And God, in the name of Jesus, I pray that those names would be gone. That the Holy Spirit would overwhelm us tonight with our true name. That we're the elect exiles, loved, chosen, redeemed by you. That we don't have to take on this fake name. We don't have to pretend to be someone we're not. But instead, I just pray that all of us tonight would live into the name that was given to us by you. And I pray that we would just trust in you more than anything else. And that as we trust in you, the one who has defeated death, hell, and the grave, we would have a living hope that can stand up against any circumstance in our life. And God, I also just want to pray for the people tonight who were feeling the winds and waves of this world. I pray they'd be overwhelmed by the shielding of God's power. That they'd feel you pick them up and say, hey, you're going home. You're going to make it. Never once have I left you. Never once have I forsaken you. Never once have I forgotten you. Because you're my son. You're my daughter. Would you believe that name? So, Father, thank you tonight that we have a reason for hope, that we have a living hope, because Jesus is alive and with us and for us. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen.